السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Taking just one oath is usually enough to capture the attention of a listener. What then if that oath was taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What then if those oaths which he took were 11 consecutive ones? And this is exactly what appears in one of the chapters of the Quran, Surah Al-Shams, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes 11 oaths, one after the other, in order to capture our attention to the weight of what he is about to then say. Read with me the oaths. He said, and count them. By the sun and its brightness. And by the moon when it follows. And by the day when it displays it. And by the night when it covers it. That's number what? Number five. وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا And by the sky, that's number six. And by the one who constructed it, that's number seven. وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طُحَاهَا And by the earth, and he who spread it, that's eight and nine. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا And by the soul, and he who proportioned it. There's your 11 consecutive oaths. Then Allah said, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا and then he showed this soul what is right and what is wrong for it. And then here comes the outcome, Jawab al Qasam, the answer of the oath. Oh Allah, you have captured our attention. What do you want to say to us after these 11 oaths? He has succeeded who purifies it, and he has failed who corrupts it. 11 consecutive oaths just to tell us that success is in meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure soul. And devastation and loss is to do the opposite. Uh, do, do we want any greater emphasis than that? I don't remember a week passing in my life, in the last couple of years, without someone coming to me with a question saying, I feel that I have lost the essence of Islam. I'm losing the joy of Iman, the purity of my soul is going. How do I restore these values? How do I feel the religion? The methods are so many. And I must admit that much of the answer is about tailoring it to the person who is asking the question. But nevertheless, there are constants. There are certain fixed elements of that answer that will never change in every answer to this type of question. And one of those fixed constants is what is salah. Salah. You see, the same way that the medics, they draw links between illnesses and medicine, and scientists, they draw links between observation and discoveries. Similarly, the Quran has also made an unmissably strong link between two matters. Tazkiyatun nafs, the purification of the soul. And salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, for example, and listen to the link. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى Successful are those who purify themselves and mentions the name of his Lord and prays. Look at the link. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ you can only warn those who fear their Lord in the unseen and they keep up the prayer. And then he said, And whoever purifies himself, he does so for his own benefit. Salah, purification of the soul. Salah, purification of the soul. The Quran makes that link obviously clear. And our Messenger, وسلم, he did the exact same thing. He would say, you burn, he said, you burn with sins. Then you pray Salatul Fajr, the dawn prayer, and it washes it. And then he said, Then you burn, you burn. He said it twice each time. Then when you pray your dhuhr, noon salah, it washes it. Then you burn, you burn. And then when you pray your asr salah, it washes it, your afternoon prayer. 
ثم تحترقون تحترقون فإذا صليتم المغرب غسلتها then you burn you burn he said then when you pray your maghrib sunset prayer it washes it away and then he said it one last time you burn تحترقون تحترقون then when you pray your final Isha night prayer it washes it away and then he said ثم تنامون then you fall asleep فلا يكتب عليكم شيء حتى تستيقظون then you fall asleep that evening and no sin is written against you till you wake up the very next morning Allahu Akbar this is salah and this is its effect in purifying the life of a person brothers and sisters as harsh as it may sound and as unpolitically correct it may be but I say with full confidence and zero hesitation that he who claims to be a Muslim acknowledges Allah as his maker and his provider and he claims to have an interest in being saved on the day of judgment yet he neglects his or her prayer you are an evil person I swear by the one who owns my life if you had any idea of what it was that you, my brother, my sister, have neglected if you are that person, you would not be able to enjoy another meal. You would not be able to fall asleep this evening. You have neglected salah, the rope of Allah, which He has extended to you from Him. You have cast aside your, your only lifeline in life. You've cast aside the act of worship, which was mentioned in the Quran in over 100 different places. And in every one of those 100 ayat, there is either a description of the bounties that Allah has prepared for those who pray, or there is a description of the trauma which awaits those who neglect it. The first of those 100 ayat speaking about salah, they begin as early as Surah Al-Baqarah, the beginning of our Mus'haf today. Alif Lam Mim, Dalik Al-Kitab, La Rayba Fi, Hudal Lil Muttaqeen, Al Ladina Yuqimun As Salah, those who established a prayer. And then the last of those 100 ayat that speak about salah is all the way in Surah Al-Kawthar, Inna Atainaka Al-Kawthar, Fasalli Li Rabbika. So pray to your Lord, Allah said, and sacrifice. Pray to your Lord and sacrifice. And in between the first and the 100th, there are tens of ayat speaking about salah. I ask you, my brother, my sister, who is unsure about giving the salah the lifelong commitment that it demands, Honestly speaking, how do you accept to put yourself in the middle of this fierce crossfire of scholarly discussion and debate about your status as a person who does not pray? Some of those scholars deem you as a non-Muslim, not to be buried or washed with the Muslims when they pass away. A non-Muslim, whilst the most lax opinion towards you as a person who does not pray is that you are a, a fasiq, meaning a rebellious sinner, the worst of the fusar. Do you honestly feel comfortable sitting right in the middle of this type of discussion? Had your grandfather or your great-grandfather been resurrected and he was told that there's going to be people from your progeny who will claim to be Muslims, but then they will refuse to pray. I guarantee he would, he would never believe in such a thing. He would consider it impossible. And subhanAllah, we find ourselves needing to almost literally drag our loved ones, our children, our siblings to pray as they slouch and they stagger and they linger. Why? That's because they haven't tasted its sweetness. They haven't felt it. You see, you invite someone to their favorite restaurant. They will arrive before you do. Why? Because they've experienced the joy of what they serve. If that person, however, is unsure about the restaurant, he's unsure of their menu, he will hesitate to accept the invitation. And he may not even show up. Similarly, if you tasted what salah offers, the real salah that is, 
not the salah that we have made it, the real salah that is, we would become addicts. Prostration will be the greatest source of comfort and relief in existence. And I want to share with you here a few examples of those before us who experienced this ecstasy with salah. Hatim al-Asam, the great worshipper from the city of Balkh, from Khurasan. His friends once asked him, كَيْفَ تُصَلِّي? Describe to us how you pray. He said the following. Listen to this. أَقُومُ بِالْأَمْرِ I carry out the obligations. وَأَمْشِي بِالْخَشِيَةِ And I walk to the mosque in fear of Allah. وَأَدْخُلُ بِالنِّيَّةِ And I set for my prayer a clear intention. وَأُكَبِّرُ بِالْعَظَمَةِ And I begin my prayer with takbir in awe of Allah. وَأَقْرَأُ بِالتَّرْتِيلِ وَبِالتَّفَكُّرِ And I recite Qur'an in a slow, calm, measured way with contemplation. وَأَرْكَعُ بِالْخُشُوعِ And I bow with submissiveness. وَأَسْجُدُ بِالتَّوَاضُعِ And I prostrate with humility. وَأَجْلِسُ لِلتَّشَهُدِ بِالتَّمَامِ And I sit correctly from my tashahud. وَأُسَلِّمُ بِالسُنَّةِ And then I end my prayer according to the sunnah. وَأُسْلِمُهَا بِالْإِخْلَاصِ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Then I hand over my prayer to Allah in the end with sincerity. And then what is the conclusion? The conclusion he said, وَأَرْجِعُ عَلَى نَفْسِي بِالْخَوْفِ أَخَافُ أَنْ لَا يُقْبَلْ مِنِّي And then I worry after this in apprehension at the thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not accepting this prayer from me. Allahu Akbar, compare that against my prayer and yours. Look at the joy they had in salah and how engaged their minds were. What about Abu Amr, Abu Amr ibn al-Ala, one of the famous seven reciters of the Qur'an? He was not too fond of leading people in salah. And once, however, he was compelled to lead, he was pushed forward to lead in prayer. And so he turned to the congregation before the salah began, and he said to them, Istawu, stand in line. As the imam would say to the people before they begin prayer, stand in line, keep in line. Istawu. The moment he said that, he fell down to the ground, and he was unconscious till the very next day. When he finally back, but began to gather himself and he woke up, they said, what, what happened? He said, as I instructed you to stand in line, I imagined Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to me, oh my servant, have you ever kept straight for me for even one moment in your life so that you should instruct other people to keep straight? So he passed out. Look at the, the consciousness, the awareness, the joy of salah, the interactivity. What about Abdullah ibn Zubair? When, when he would engage in his prayer, birds would actually descend onto him. Due to the length of his bowing and his prostration, they would think he's a stump of wood or a block of stone or something. And then when he would enter into his home, silence would usually descend upon his household out of like awe and respect to Abdullah ibn Zubair. But the moment he would start praying, they would resume their talk and their socializing and the chit chat would continue. Because they knew that the moment Abdullah, he begins his prayer with Allahu Akbar, he's disconnected from this life. He's established a completely separate connection with the Most High Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is, this is Salah. What about Umar radiallahu anhu, the closest companion to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming second place only to Abu Bakr. When he was fatally stabbed by Abu Lu'lu during the Isha Salah in Masjid al-Madani, al-Madina, his side opened up, he fell unconscious, they gave him milk, it came out the side. He fell unconscious. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, and a group of the Ansar, the companions, they carried the Khalifa, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to his home. And he remained unconscious from Isha, the night, till Fajr. One man said, we, we have to wake him up. And then another person said, you will not be able to wake him up through anything other than the mentioning of Salah. So one man said to him, leader of the believers, it's time to pray. And at once he woke up, he passed his hands over his eyes, and he said, Naam, 
لا حظ في الإسلام لمن ترك الصلاة. Yes, there is no Islam in the life of a person who does not pray. Those were his first words, and shortly after his salah, he would die. This was, this was their, this was their life with salah. It was a a meeting that settled the the aches of their hearts. It was a pleasure that they simply could not function without. It was a source of inner relief that they could not replace with anything else. And so they wanted to pray a lot. They wanted to prolong those moments with that Lord whom they love so much. You see, brothers and sisters, how much salah gives to you depends entirely on how much you give to salah. How much your salah plays a role in purifying you depends on your effort to purify your prayer from distraction, from laziness, from half-heartedness, from delay. How much salah transforms your life and your afterlife depends on how much you invest in transforming your salah. Don't blame anyone but yourself. And this is why we say to those people who argue and they say, you know, I read in the Quran that salah apparently prevents and guards a person from immorality and sin. Ya akhi, I've been praying for years. I don't see it protecting me against sins. Same habits for years, nothing has changed. But I pray five times a day. What's going on? Hasn't changed me. See, there's only one of two options here. Either the book of Allah has told a lie, Astaghfirullah, and seeing that that is not an option, it must be the second option. You have not carried out the type of prayer that transforms the human being and guards him from sin. It must be that. Either we blame the book of Allah and its promise, or either we blame ourselves not praying correctly. That's why we haven't seen its fruit. And a person can comprehend and understand how a disbeliever who denies Allah, rejects Islam, doesn't pray. It's understandable. The baffling one for me is the one who claims to believe in Allah, the home of the hereafter. And then he fails with respect to the five prayers. That's the mind-boggling one. Does he not realize just how nude of every form of support he shall be on that day without salah? how far away he is from wisdom? Does he not realize that life itself is not worth living without salah? Don't excuse yourself by saying, I find it hard to enjoy salah. You know, I just, I don't feel attached to it. That's why I'm struggling to commit. I honestly would advise that we don't use these labels for ourselves because it will create a victim mentality, causing us to not take responsibility for our lives. No, the reality of the matter is this. We are the ones who cause ourselves to become attached to things. It's self-inflicted. You know, whether we talk about any type of addiction, right? From this side of the scale to that side of the scale. We're talking about tea addicts or we're talking about chain smokers. We're talking about uh, compulsive gamblers. We're talking about uh, porn addicts, whatever it may be. It is man who nurtures these attachments by virtue of his own doings, by repeated visits, constant browsing, perpetual gazing. We do that. Then it takes hold of our hearts. We create habits. So don't argue that salah is just not happening in my life. I'm not feeling it. No, no. Realize we are the creator of habits. So on that note, train yourself to miss the salah, to, to yearn for the salah. I'll give you an example. Practically speaking, an hour passes by. You're at work, you're in school. You're, an hour passes by without you prostrating Get up and pray two rakat. Go and get up and pray two units. With the passage of time, it may even start waking you up at night to do that. As you feel this urge to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu once woke up during the night before Fajr. And he stared into the sky. And then he recited the verse where Allah said, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Subhanaka faqina adhab al-nar. My Lord, you have not created all of this without purpose. You are above that. So please protect us from the torment of the fire. And then he washed, he prayed, and then he went back to sleep. He did that a second time, and he did that a third time in one night. All 
before Salatul Fajr, the dawn prayer, before he then woke up and did his Fajr with the Muslims. So this is how the believer feels, the one who misses the Salah, yearns for Salah. They say there's too many hours between Fajr, the dawn prayer, and Duhr, noon. There's too many hours to pass by without filling it with some sort of Salah. If you, if you don't feel the urge to pray during that long time, then we may not have experienced the joy of Salah. The one who loves Salah fills this time with some sort of prayer, Duha or otherwise. As you say to yourself, how can I allow all these hours to pass without renewing my knot of Iman, without fortifying my defenses against Shaytan, without refreshing my connection with the Quran? I can't leave all of those hours unfilled with some sort of Salah. Why? Because you love Salah. You miss Salah. And that is a station that can be arrived at. But it requires time, it requires patience, it requires exercise, it requires training. Till such a person feels that the cure to every challenge in his or her life is found in that salah. Fall out with a family member or a friend? Prayer mat is rolled out for salah. Islamic knowledge is, is not being achieved. You're working in the Islamic field, you're reading, trying to memorize, you've joined so many courses, you're not really gaining any grounds. Solution is found in Salah. Finances begin to plummet. Immediate retreat to Salah. An enemy who is, is on your case, threats are made to you, you are in a state of fear, protection is sought in Salah. Loneliness reaches unbearable levels. You're trying to find work, you're trying to find a spouse, you want Allah to provide you with children, you want a vision in your life, you find your answer in Salah. Allahu Akbar. The relationship between you and your salah, your prayer, is almost identical to your phone's relationship with its charger. Without that charger, your phone's light dims, its sounds are silenced, and its function as a phone comes to an end. Similarly, without your charger as a believer, your salah, your light will dim. Your voice of wisdom is silenced. Your sense of security is smashed. Your contentment with what Allah has given you is ruined. Your anxiety is unleashed. And your function as a human being comes to an end. The conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, if you are finding it difficult to commit to salah, arguing that it's boring, it's heavy, realize it is not salah that you have an issue with. No. In reality, you are at odds with your version of Salah. Because if it was the real Salah, you would be possessed by passion and a yearning to return to it and an ever-growing sense of pressure to become a better Muslim with fewer sins because of that Salah. So it is not Salah that you dislike. Don't blame yourself. It is not Salah that you dislike. Don't blame the Salah. You hate what your Salah has become. So make an effort to bring it back and just simply observe how you will change from day to day into a brand new person whom you thought you could never become.